say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. And I can be who it says I can be. My mind's alert. My heart's receptive to receive the uncompromising, the unchanging, the infallible seed of the Word of God. For this is God's Word speaking to me. So look to your neighbor and say, this is God's Word speaking to you. So be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. You may be seated if you can. Hallelujah. Well, I'm excited tonight. I'm going to continue my message on, this will be the fourth message on the life of Elijah. And the uh, subtitle is Overcoming Discouragement. And um, I think you can find some nuggets in this thing that will help you tonight. Uh, before I get started, um, we've been talking about uh, the miracles that Elijah did. And we can learn from those strong men and prophets in the Bible who walk by faith and not by sight. And, uh, but just because they were strong men in the Bible don't mean they were perfect. And, you know, we can not only learn from what they did do, but we also can learn from, from the mistakes they made. Come on, everybody say amen. amen. We can learn from the mistakes that they made and how they got caught in certain situations. I know when I was growing up, I learned a lot about what not to do by watching my older brother. <laughs> That's a true story. I learned what happens when you lie to your mom and daddy. <laughs> I, I learned what happens when you break curfew and you come home later than you should. And for goodness sake, I learned not to bring the wrong girl, wrong girl home. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he did that. You know, Kathy. <laughs> he bring the wrong girl home, and it just ain't gonna work. <laughs> mama start interceding in a heartbeat, and when Mama ain't approve of it, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> his, her faith was stronger than his faith at the time. Amen. <laughs> So, so we can learn. That's why I got married at a young age. I got married when I, I met the right one here at Victory Life Church. And uh, met, we got married when I was 21 years old. So she, she trained me up a little bit. <laughs> we won't get into the marriage seminar tonight. But uh, we can learn from other people's mistakes. And uh, so I just want you to know that before we get started. But, you know, the, when we left off, we left off, of course, when uh, Elijah had finally, the, it was a three and a half year drought. And the, there was a showdown between the prophets of Baal. And, and after that, uh, the slaughter of 450 prophets of Baal was uh, down at the brook of Kishon. That, uh, but he turned almost the whole of it, all of Israel back to the back to Christ. He, he rescued him out of the pits of hell and turned their hearts back to Christ. And then, of course, he went up to, uh, and, and to the Mount Carmel and he prayed and interceded that it would rain. And, of course, rain came down. And uh, so we want to pick up right there uh, tonight. And uh, we're going to start off in 1 Kings. Oh, man, I didn't give him my scriptures tonight. Anyway, just do the best you can. First Kings chapter 18, we're going to be reading verse 45 and 46. Um, and it says, Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and the wind, and there was a what? Heavy rain. Heavy rain. There was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Now, Ahab, you know, was the king of Israel at the time, and his wife was Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, and she was a wicked woman. We know that, but she was a very wicked woman. Then it says, Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and Elijah girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now, the power of God was still on Elijah. The anointing of God was still on Elijah, and that's why he was able to run ahead of Ahab. Now, Ahab had a chariot that was attached to horses. So I want you to get a picture of that. 
Now, the, 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 uh, the distance from Mount Carmel to Jezreel was approximately 20 miles. Now, this is right good distance. I, I, don't, I don't even think it's 20 miles to Smithfield. I think it's less than 20 miles all the way to Smithfield. I think it's like 16 or 18 miles to Smithfield. So that gives you an idea of how far Elijah ran. At, and, and take it now, it was raining at the time. So he ran ahead of Ahab. And Elijah arrived before Ahab did. He got there before him. And I believe one of the purposes that Elijah uh, ran ahead of Ahab, because I think God was protecting Ahab. He was, he was preserving him because Ahab was going to see Jezebel. So he was going to go tattle on Elijah and tell, and tell uh, uh, Jezebel what Elijah had done. You know, everybody was talking about that, one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. Many witnesses saw this happen. So he was trying to hurry up and get to Jezebel, but God needed to protect him, so he wanted to give uh, Elijah a head start. Amen. Amen. So God was once again preserving Elijah. Now let's look back at Elijah's busy day. This is all in one day. God said to that morning, go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Remember that? He was to convince Obadiah, which was Ahab's right-hand man, which was a child of God, which Ahab didn't know about it, but he was to convince Obadiah that he truly will present to himself to Ahab that day. And then he, was a, uh, he, he convinces Ahab to gather all the people in Israel to assemble at Mount Carmel. And then there was a showdown between the prophets of Baal and Almighty God. Then, after that, he prays fire down from heaven, but after that he won over the people of Israel and they slaughtered 450 false prophets of Baal. Then he goes back up to the top of Mount Carmel and he intercedes for rain. Remember? He sent a servant out there seven times and finally the seventh time he saw the cloud the size of a man's hand and it started to rain. See, Elijah had to be tired. I mean, that showdown with the prophets of Baal was ours. That, that, was, that was an all-day event. Remember they interceded, the prophets of Baal cut themselves dancing and got louder and from morning till evening. And anyway, that was an all-day event. So he had to be tired. So when you're physically and mentally drained, that's when you can count on the enemies coming for you. You know, he, 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 he likes to attack you at your weakest moment. Amen. So, as you can see, even though you can do everything right, Elijah did everything right. You can put your total trust in God. You can be completely obedient to God, and things don't turn out the way you think they should. Amen. How many have been there and done that? Amen. They don't turn out the way we think they should turn out. It's like when you felt like you were, well, you felt led to say something to somebody or to a family member, or you felt led to say something to a, a co-worker to minister to them that didn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they didn't receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, even though you knew that God told you to go minister to them. But they didn't receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. See, your first thought may be, well, I must have missed God. Well, no, not necessarily. See, you're not responsible for the puzzle. Amen. You're responsible for the piece of the puzzle. You're not always responsible for the harvest. You're responsible for sowing the seed. Or you may be responsible for just watering the seed. So you're not always responsible for the harvest. That's God's responsibility. That's, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And he may, need you, he may just use you to sow a seed, may use you to water the seed, and somebody else is going to come and close the deal. Right? right? So we've got to keep that in mind. So let's look on. Let's keep reading. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. It says, And Ahab, I told you he was going to go tattle. Ahab... <laughs> told Jezebel all Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. 
Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he rose and ran for his life. Jezebel put a price on his head. Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. That's what she said. You're done. I'm going to kill you. Tomorrow this time, it's over. Now, up to this point, now you realize Elijah had been led by the Holy Spirit. So let's read on. It says, and when he saw that message, he rose and ran for his life. It didn't say God told him to run for his life. It says that he ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. That's the only second time that a servant has been mentioned in this, in this passage of Scripture. The first time was when he sent a servant up there to look for rain. Now, there's no, there's no other mentioning of a servant. So I don't know if, if he picked up a servant at the showdown with the prophets of Baal or he had a servant all along. We don't know that. But we don't know much about this servant. But I promise you, the next servant you'll know something about. But anyway, it says but in verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Some, some translation says he collapsed under a broom tree, which that's probably more of what happened if you think about all that Elijah went to that day. His body was saying, I'm done. I'm physically drained. I can't go no more. Enough is enough. Now, I can relate to, 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 to Elijah in this form of capacity. Now, I used to be in construction. I used to have my own business. I was a Class A contractor. I had a crew that did brick and block foundations and footings for other contractors. And so I, I worked hard for 22 years, um, and I, I, I was overheated about three or four times in those 24 years, and a couple of them was real serious. And I can remember one time actually collapsing because you, your body just gives up. You know, you, they call it, you get your monk, the monkey got on your back is what they call it. And then you try to go back to work and you just physically cannot do it. And you're, you're done. Your body says enough's enough. You start cramping. Your body starts cramping up. Your hands start curling up. And you, 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 you don't. You got to get some fluids. And even though I was drinking fluids throughout the whole day, when this up a, oh, 100 degrees, over 95 degrees and 100 degrees, it's, you can't stay hydrated. You just can't do it when you're working hard, you know, when you're outside working. So I, know, I can see how his body has just collapsed and say, I'm done, enough's enough. And, of course, we know that's when the devil wants to attack you at that moment because you, you, you don't have the strength to do anything. You don't feel like praying. You don't feel like praising. You don't feel like worshiping. You just, you're completely dehydrated and done. So it says here, but he himself went a day's journey to the world, sat under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. Elijah prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Now, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? That all that Elijah had done for God, he said, I'm done. Enough's enough. But here we see the human side of Elijah. He was just like us. He was a man. We see the human side of Elijah up to this point. He has been operating out of faith. Now, he's operating out of what? fear. He was operating out of fear now. Maybe he was assuming that Ahab and Jezebel would see their corruption for what it was and repent and turn their life back over to Christ. That's what probably what he was thinking. That would have been a reasonable assumption, right? But that didn't happen. A lot of times things don't turn out quite the way we think they should. And one thing you would never be able to control is how people respond. See, Elijah thought he could turn Jezebel and Ahab around for the glory of God. So he, he, he wasn't focusing on that. He was focusing on, on the, what he couldn't do instead of what he could do or what he had done. Amen? Amen. So it says here, two, let me say this. Two things I live by or I keep in the back of my mind. Number one, 
Don't worry about things you have no control over. That helps me, help me out throughout the years. I don't worry about things I have no control over. Number two, I never let people surprise me. That's easier said than done because <laughs> people still end up surprising you. But never let people surprise you. But Elijah was surprised at Ahab and Jezebel's response. Jezebel made an oath to kill Elijah. But her oath didn't mean nothing because it was made at her word. See, when Elijah made an oath, he made an oath by God's word. But Jezebel made an oath at her word. Now, when she said she was going to kill Elijah, Jesus, I mean, God was up there saying, uh-uh, that ain't never going to happen. She made a public confession that Elijah was going to be killed the next day. Well, Elijah wasn't killed the next day. He wasn't killed the next week. He wasn't killed the next month. He, didn't even, he, he never was killed. Elijah was taken up in the rapture and the glory of God. The chariots came down from heaven and swooped him up right in front of Elisha and 50 other witnesses. So God wanted to make sure Jezebel got no credit for taking Elijah out. Amen? Amen. So she had no, but see, she, she, she truly was an evil woman, but she had no power and no authority over Elijah. Because Elijah was chosen by God. And when you're chosen by God, he's going to protect you. He's going to make sure that you're protected as a child of God. Amen? Amen. So, uh, uh, so Elijah here was chosen by God, and his, Elijah's purpose wasn't fulfilled yet. He still had work to do. Now, it says here in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God, you know this scripture, read it with me, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, we see here Elijah was operating in the spirit of fear, right? He was operating in the spirit. He felt powerless. He was running for his life. He was in the wilderness. He was hiding out. He was by himself. He wanted to die. He prayed that he would die. So he was powerless, and he wasn't operating in a sound mind. He was operating in basically a tormented mind. He was discouraged. Discouragement has truly set in, right? Now, discouragement, if you look at the root word, of course, from discouragement, the root word is courage. But when you add the prefix dis, D-I-S, that means the opposite of. So discouragement is the opposite of courage, right? And when we're discouraged, that means we've lost the motivation to press forward or, we, or we've lost the motivation to keep going. When we're discouraged. Now, how can I say this? Discouragement, or let me say it this way. There's no prejudice in discouragement. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're a high-profile Christian like Elijah was. It doesn't matter if, if you're a pastor or a teacher. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're a praise and worship leader or if you're on a praise and worship team. It doesn't matter if you're department head at Victory Life Church. It doesn't matter if, if you're one of the team members that volunteer here at Victory Life Church. In other words, discouragement can come upon any of us. Right? So that's what I mean by there, it's not prejudice. Discouragement doesn't matter who you are. It still can come on you. Or it can, we all had, let me say this, opportunities for discouragement to come on us. Are you with me tonight? Now let's keep going. Um, but let, I tell you what, let's go to Psalms 42.5 and let's see how uh, uh, David talks about discouragement and what we should do. I didn't have this in type in my notes. So I'm, all right, 42.5 says this. David's writing, says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you discouraged? quieted within me. In other words, why are you discouraged? That's what he's saying. And then he answers it. He says, hope in God. For I shall yet what? Praise. Praise him for the help of his counsels. He is our divine helper. When we feel that, when we feel that discouragement coming on, that should be like a warning light to us to say, uh-oh, I can feel it coming on. I got to do something here. You can't just settle into that mode, right? So when you're in discouragement, you think, you know, the, the mountain's too high. 
or you may think the valley is too dark, or you may be stuck in a rut. You know, even in marriages sometimes you get discouraged how things are in marriage, and you're stuck in a rut. And I know I've got a, a four-wheel drive pickup truck, so when I get stuck in a rut, I just put it in four-wheel drive. <laughs> and, and the light comes on, lets me know, hey, you're in four-wheel drive, and the front end kicks in, and it'll pull me right out. See, so I suggest when, when, you're, uh, when you're battling discouragement or discouragement's coming on you, uh, you, you got to change gears. Yes. you got to shift gears. In other words, you put a P up there and put it in praise. Amen. you gotta, you got to switch gears. A lot of times in life, that'll help us get out of anything. When you start, don't know what to do, we just shift gears and start praising God. We stop praising and worshiping. You ain't going to feel like it, especially when discouragement has tried to set in because of life situations, circumstances, your spouse ain't acting right, you know. Um, you just shift gears, yeah. right? That didn't go over too well. Come on, church. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's keep reading. <laughs> First Kings 19, 5 through 10. All right, All right Pastor Jason, I need some encouragement tonight. I need you to, I need you to pump me up. <laughs> First Kings 19, chapter 5 and 10, it says, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree. Now remember, we did, by this time Elijah was completely exhausted, right? So an angel touched him. Suddenly an angel touched him. I told you God would protect you. An angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Now, you notice here that God was meeting his physical needs first. He was meeting his physical needs first because he couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't function without getting some energy put back into him. He was completely drained. So let's look at this. Then, look, he, then he looked, and there beside his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. Man, I bet that tasted good, didn't it? He probably hadn't eaten all day. He probably fasted up to that point. Yeah, so, so he ate and drank, and he lay down again. So his body needed rest. It needed food and water. And then look at verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time, after he probably had plenty of sleep. He came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat again. Because the journey is too great for you. So the angel was motivating him here and said, you're not done yet. In other words, <laughs> you're not finished. God is not going to answer the prayer that he's going to kill you. <laughs> you're not going to die. Even though he prayed to die, God didn't answer that prayer, right? He knew it wasn't his best interest for him to die. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Harab, which is uh, the same as Mount Sinai, which that's where Moses got the commandments from, the mountain of God. So it, it, I'm thinking, this is just me thinking, that he's looking to get close to the Father. He, he's looking to go in the presence of God. So now God didn't tell him to go here. He didn't know where it says that God spoke to him and told him to go here, right? So let's look on in verse 9. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This is the first time the word of the Lord came to him after that showdown with the prophets of Baal. What are you doing here, Elijah? And listen to what Elijah said. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Zealous means filled with or inspired by intense enthusiasm, devoted to, or being diligent. So, so, so what he was saying, Elijah was saying, God, I, I, I've been devoted to you. I've done what you told me to do. I've been obedient to your word. I've done exactly what you said do. And look what else he says. For the children, this is Elijah saying, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant torn down your altars and kill your prophets with the sword, which that's what Jezebel did. But, the, but Obadiah saved a hundred of those. Remember that? I alone am left 
which was not really true. That was not a true statement because there were some other ones that have survived as far as the prophets. And they seek to take my life. So here we get a glimpse into the mindset of Elijah. So he chose to focus on the negative. So, so when you focus on the wrong thing, it can lead you into discouragement. See, Elijah, look at what he did do. He, he, he raised a widow son back to life. He, 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 he prayed that the rain would stop. Then he prayed again that the rain would start back. He, he resurrected thousands of Israelites out of the pits of hell, got them repented back, focused on Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But he didn't focus on that. He focused on Israel forsake your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and they seek to take my life. That's where his mindset was. And sometimes we can focus on the wrong thing, and that'll keep discouragement coming, right? So let's look at this. In other words, I have done everything, and I said I've done everything I could do. I have done the best that I can do, and they still seek to take my life. Amen. Elijah was a targeted man, no doubt. And Satan was looking for revenge. Satan was looking for revenge. The enemy had suffered. Satan had suffered a huge, a huge defeat at the, the prophets of Baal at Mount Sinai. I mean, at Mount, uh, yeah, Mount uh, Sinai. I mean, Mount Carmel. He had suffered a huge defeat at Mount Carmel. So the enemy was looking for revenge. So I believe that when, when the moment that he killed all those false prophets, that Satan was looking to kill Elijah, and he had an instrument, which was Jezebel. But that is his nature, Right? Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But thank God he comes to bring life and to bring it more abundantly. Right? But then let me say this. Let me say this. There is a difference between testing and temptation. There's a difference between testing and temptation. Temptation comes from your own lust and desires. Temptation comes from your fleshly wants. It comes from your own lust and desire. Look at James chapter 1. I'm going to give you time to turn there because I want you to see it. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. In James chapter 1, starting with verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who endures what? Temptation. Temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amen. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Amen. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Amen. God doesn't tempt you. The devil may be a part of tempting you, but you're tempted when you give in to your own fleshly desires. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it's full grown, brings forth death. That's what temptation is. Now, testing is an opportunity to you, for you to grow in faith. See, besides, you need faith, of course, to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if after that, you wouldn't need faith if you were never tested. Amen. Follow me? Testing is a part of being disciplined and, and a part of preparation. Testing allows our faith to get stronger and it allows us to be more mature in the knowledge and the things of Christ. Elijah here was in another test where he needed to be strengthened and prepare himself for God's next assignment. You follow me? He was being tested here. He wasn't being tempted to do anything wrong. He did something wrong by running away from Jezebel. God didn't tell him to do that. But how many of you know God's a restorer? Thank God for a restorer. Amen. So let's look at 1 Kings. Let's read on verse nine, I mean, chapter 19, 
verses 13 through 18. It says this, So it was when Elijah heard it, I'm skipping just a little bit, and then what I'm talking about here is he heard what? A small, quiet voice. Then he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, Here again, what are you doing here, Elijah? So that tells me that wasn't God's plan for Elijah to be there. Because God didn't know why he was there. It wasn't God's plan for him to be there. Amen. So he said, I have been, same thing. He gives the same answer. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel has forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. With the sword I alone and left, and they, they, they seek to take my life. He says the exact same thing that he said last time you asked him. So he was still in a mindset of discouragement. He still was focusing on the wrong thing. Amen? He was still focusing on the wrong thing. Now, the Lord said to him, now, the Lord said to him, let's have a pity party then. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. He didn't say, well, I'm going to send an angel over there and, and, and rub your head and pat you on the back. No, he didn't say that. The Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. In other words, I got something for you to do. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also, you should anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, anoint him, the son of Shaphat, shall anoint as a prophet in your place. In other words, Elisha is going to be your successor. Now, it had been another six or seven years before he succeeded Elijah, but he was to anoint him at that moment because Elisha needed to be prepared to take over Elijah's position. So it says here in verse 17, it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Now, let me go back to it. Then verse 18 says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth has not kissed him. God was answering him when he said, I alone am left. God was reminding him, No, I've reserved 7,000. So you can just rest assured you're not the only one left. But I, I was researching verse 17 when it says, It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Now, this is important because God would use these three men as the instruments of judgment against the rest of the Baal worshipers. The MacArthur Study Bible says it this way. It says, By the time... The last of these three men died. Baalism had been officially barred from Israel. You remember I said you're not always going to be the one to close the deal? You're not always going to be the one to, to, to get the harvest? God's going to use you to either sow the seed or water the seed. So the seed was sowed and watered, but then later on the harvest would come. Right? So, so here, let's look at 1 Kings let me wrap this up here. So these three men were, were extremely important to finish what Elijah had started. Amen. Now it says here, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Now notice here, Elisha was out working in the field. See, God ain't going to bless lazy folk. Come on. God's not going to put a mantle on lazy folk. If you're not willing to work for God, then you're not going to be chosen. That didn't go over too well. <laughs> then Elijah passed by and he threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. 
And he said to them, go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Now I'm going to pick up right there next time, but I want you to see something here. I'm, I'm, let me, let me, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. When Elijah went to Beersheba, the servant he had then says, you stay here, I'm going on to the wilderness. And the servant obeyed him. But there's going to be times now, I think it's three times, Elisha, Elijah tells Elisha, you stay here, you don't go with me. Elisha refused to do that. He refused to leave Elijah's side as a servant to Elijah. And because of, no, I can't get into that. But, but something happens because of that. Amen? Now, let me just, uh, let me, I come across this. It kind of fits in with my message. I, I just want to read it real quick. This says, if the game goes into overtime, God always wins. I got time to read this real quick. In the spring of 2018, the Baylor Bears men's basketball team was scrapping for every game in hopes of making the big dance, the NCAA. In one important matchup, the Bears led the Texas Longhorns almost the whole game. At the end, the game seemed neatly in hand. I know what the Bears were thinking. They was up by three points with just a few seconds. The buzzer will sound and will start celebrating. While they were looking forward to the fun bus ride home, Texas inbounded the ball with almost no time left. Suddenly, their guard heaved a miraculous shot, unlikely to go in. As the buzzer sounded, the three-pointer switched to tie the game. Overtime. The Bears thought they'd finish. They thought they'd won. And suddenly, they had to gear up for five more minutes. The fight hadn't stopped. Ever had a time in life handed you overtime? Elijah did. The mighty prophet of Israel had defeated 450 prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel and proven Yahweh to be the one supreme Lord of all. Then out of nowhere, the pagan queen Jezebel, who had invested a lot in the prophets of Baal, threatened Elijah's life. It's odd. Elijah had seen the fire of God fall. Elijah had experienced God's power and might. Elijah, as much as any man alive in Israel, knew that God was sovereign, but the queen's threat landed with great force in Elijah's soul. Why? It was overtime for Elijah. He had given his all, thought he'd won, and the sudden thought of having to fight another day just seemed like too much to bear. The mighty prophet became discouraged and retreated into the wilderness. He had given up. Overtime comes when you least expect it. Perhaps your marriage goes through a big crisis and you've reconciled, but all of a sudden one argument seems to threaten it all. Or maybe you're a business owner and you're landed the big contract when all of a sudden a competitor surfaces with a competing bid. Or maybe they're, they're, the chemo treatments are over, but there's a new scan that raises questions, and now new treatment is recommended overtime. The Bears didn't beat the Longhorn in overtime last year. They beat them in double overtime. When Elijah went into overtime, God sent an angel to feed him and tell him there was still a great, a great journey ahead to do. If you're in overtime, God will feed and lead you to, and that's the gospel. That is a great God-given journey in front of you. Elijah had defeated 450 prophets at Mount Carmel, proven Yahweh to be the one true God, and established himself as Israel's mighty miracle worker prophet. But when the pagan queen Jezebel threatened him, he ran for his life into despair how human all the great heroes of God are. To cure his despair, God sent an angel to minister to the prophet. The heavenly messenger touched him and gave him an odd word. Arise and eat. The journey is too great for you. At first, it's hard to see the encouragement in the angel's words. What's so encouraging about reminding a tired prophet that he has a long way 
still to go. I once heard of some, a, semina, a, semina, a seminarian, no, a semin, seminarian, seminarian, who continually announced, I will go far in this ministry. His classmates got tired of hearing him say, I will go far, I will go far, I will go far. Finally, someone asked the confident student, why do you say that all the time? Are you arrogant or what? The seemingly boastful student responded, I'm just repeating what all my professors told me. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times. They always tell me, son, you have a long way to go. <laughs> he said, if you have a long way to go, that means you're going to go far. <laughs> the angel didn't encourage the depressed prophet with bumper stickers, cliches. Instead, God's messenger strengthened Elijah with deep truth. The truth is, Elijah, you have a long way to go. Your ministry isn't over. You have more miracles to be wrought through you, and the most important task lies ahead. You'll transfer your mantle to Elisha, who will be used for twice as many miracles as you. And as a long road, it's a hard road, but God will be with you. Arise and eat. You have a long way to go. Amen. I thought that would be kind of... I thought that would go good with my message, and uh, but there's a lot of truth to that. You know, the devil's going to want to keep you in a place of discouragement. Well, like I said, you, sometimes you just got to change gears. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Sometimes you just got to change gears. So next time you come across someone that's in discouragement, you say, hey, man, you got to change gears. You got to switch gears. You got to put it in P. Put it in praise. Hallelujah. Amen.